with so many conflicts going on right now, so many food crises all around in the world, like Gaza or Sudan or Haiti, how does the World Food Program make the decision of where these resources will go, where these food supplies will go? That's a really tough one, Bernice. Um, WFP is 100% voluntarily funded. So we have to raise our money. And the way we do it is we bring the realities of who is in need in their situations to the world through our reports, through the reports that you quoted at the beginning of the podcast, right? Now, there's not enough resources to get to everybody, as you said. So how do we take the decisions? We take the decisions, first and foremost, based on people's needs, right? Who, who's the worst off? Who do we need to get to first? Who's on that brink of, of famine and starvation? We need to pull them back. That's number one. We also take decisions around those that have given us the funding because many organizations, many member states say, look, we're giving you this money, but we really need you to spend it here or there. So sometimes our choices are already factored into where we go, right? And who we need to reach. And, and the third thing I would say is, as an organization, I'm very proud of this piece. We never give up advocating to get to everybody right and it's sometimes it's very tough and and i have seen in in many of our countries and especially the countries i've worked you have to decide do you give everybody a little bit less when you don't have enough money or do you give less people the full amount and food security is a tough one because you and i know that we need a certain caloric thick intake for your daily needs, for your energy. So when you start to give less, people do suffer. But you want to make sure that that giving and that support doesn't exacerbate tensions. Because as we've seen, if you remember when you're reading the Arab sp Spring, when the cost of bread went so high in Egypt and people couldn't buy food, it results in tensions. It results in violence. So. You have to take all of those issues into account when you decide who receives food. And you have to make sure you have an open and transparent ongoing conversation with the member states and the countries you work so they understand what's going to happen when it's less and what's going to happen when you're forced to make these choices. And if we are going to only feed one population and not the other, what are the repercussions, especially on the children and the mothers and those who bear the greatest brunt? So it's a tough one. Yeah. So after this long process of deciding where to allocate the food, what's the process of actually providing and distributing the food to the countries for conflict and emergency situations? So first step is understanding who needs food, right? So the first step is always a real detailed and a consensus understanding of the needs of populations. And once you've got that, and for us, it's very clear WFP is in the toughest places and in the places where the hunger levels are the highest. And those are mostly conflict countries. They're not all conflict countries, but they're conflict countries. Now, in these countries, Scarlett, Benice, we have to first and foremost have the permission of the government or be invited by the government to come in and help. Right? Many countries don't want external assistance and they don't want anyone interfering in their internal politics, for example. But first you have to be invited and you have to be requested to support. And then once we do, that's when we look at the situation and we decide, are markets functional? And if markets are functional, we really try to support people through the delivery of cash. Cash allows them to make their own choices, allows them to spread their the resources they have in a way that supports their family because people know knows best how to to look after their their own families right and that also then keeps markets alive and keeps the local economy functional which is really important you don't want to go in and and leave a country in a worse off condition than when you arrived so we start with that real focus on supporting the country in many of our countries however and you'll see this from the news markets are not functional 
and conflict has got so bad that you need to physically bring food in. And that's when our supply chain kicks in. And that requires, in, especially in conflict settings, permission to move trucks, searching of our trucks to check that that's exactly what we're moving and not anything else. There's a level of scrutiny that's quite tough. A lot of monitoring because food inside a conflict area can not end up in people's hands. And we have to be very careful about that. So it's a tough one. If you look at South Sudan, we fly in our food and sometimes have to drop our food where people can come and get it. In many of our, our Asian countries, we're using, and even here in Ecuador, we're using boats because it's overseas. If I remember my time in the Middle East, that was a little bit more sophisticated and we had that combination of cash. So you could upload a voucher onto a telephone. Right? And then with the telephone, you can go to a shop and claim your food. And that's automatic, you know, without even having to move anything. You could do it all from the computer. So we've got a range of tools now where we can provide cash and vouchers and physically move food, depending on the situation of the country. Right. That's interesting how you mentioned there are these different ways of helping a country and maybe on different levels too, whether it's nationwide or targeting individuals. But the cash thing was interesting too, as in you give this resource that they can spend in their own way. Right. So it isn't you're providing them with this one thing. They can meet their own needs. That's right. And it's more dignified, you know, it's much more dignified for a family. And nobody wants to be given food. You want to be able to go into a shop and be like everybody else. And when I worked in Jordan, and I went to our local supermarket, Carrefour. I was lining up along with all our Syrian refugees who, who were also receiving food through our vouchers on their phone. And you couldn't tell the difference. And that was great because it allowed them to become part of society and to look after their families. And it, it built a level of, I would say, social cohesion mm -hmm. through the way that we provided exactly. and they're the ones in control. cash for food. The thing is about providing all these resources to all these people, there are definitely many challenges when it comes to providing resources to conflict regions, as in maybe there might be certain limitations or you might not be able to access certain areas such as in the Gaza Strip. So how does the WFP kind of work around these obstacles? So we're very much part of a system, Bernice. So WFP is part of a group of agencies who are all trying to reach people. And we have a structure in every country, a coordination platform, and it's coordinated by a resident humanitarian coordinator. And through that system, we negotiate with both sides of a conflict or with those who are involved with the conflict, asking for permissions, proposing options, ensuring that we are neutral, that we are impartial, that we are principled in our approach. And that then influences what we can and can't do, right? So this is where we go back to that situation where food security is, is really intrinsically linked with peace. And you'll remember that I think our proudest moment was when WFP received the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago now. And that's because of that recognition. I should also remember that the UN Security Council passed a resolution. This is something you guys should take a look at. A resolution, the number is 2417, and it's on conflict and hunger. And it outlines how we need to have the support to get to people in conflict settings. I won't go into all the details now, but food security and that negotiation and ensuring your neutrality and impartiality is the first step towards being allowed to operate in a conflict country, right? But you have to negotiate access. Access is, is something that a warring side can give you for one day or could give you regularly, depending on how you deliver assistance. So that coordination effort and that negotiation for access is a prerequisite for us to be able to reach people. It's kind, kind of complicated because in many of the countries we work, there are different parties to the conflict and, and you've got to be able to build and maintain a relationship with everybody because of our neutrality, because of our impartiality. 
and because we are a humanitarian organization so our whole objective is to ensure that everybody that needs food assistance can get it and that's regardless of where the conflict is and conflict lines.